Welcome to episode 6 of this RabbitMQ EasyNetQ video series. Today I'm going to show you, finally, how to use EasyNetQ. We're going to look at three different communication patterns that EasyNetQ supports. And note that you can do all three of these with plain old RabbitMQ.net library. But with EasyNetQ it's easier because EasyNetQ does a lot of the legwork for us using its opinions and conventions. And if you're interested in learning more about conventions, you'll see the last episode in this series. The three patterns we're going to cover today are publish and subscribe, send and receive, and request and response. And there are other patterns that EasyNetQ supports as well as an advanced API that allows you to get closer to RabbitMQ. So check out the EasyNetQ documentation if you're interested in learning more. Okay, let's go to the code. So get the messages project. I've added two new classes. My message is still there. I'll use that to demonstrate publish and subscribe. My other message is a new class I've created. It's just a different type of message with different fields in it. I'll use to demonstrate the send and receive. And then my response, which I'll use to demonstrate the request and response method. Let's start with publish and subscribe. I've created a console app here that I'm going to use to demonstrate all three of these methods. Let's start with publish and subscribe. And we'll just start with publish. So I'll uncomment that. And I'll show you the publish method here. So what I want to do is, in, in publish, I'm just going to, every one second, I'm going to publish a new message. And the way I do that is I first connect to EasyNetQ using rabbithutch.createBus and then I pass in a connection string and um, I'm just using my local instance of RabbitMQ for that. And that's, uh, that's all I have to do to connect. Then I'm going to go into an infinite loop and I'm going to create a new message. It's going to be a random message so it'll be a different name, different shoe size every time. And then all I do is take that bus and say bus.publish message. And EasyNetQ is going to say, all right, well, that message is of type, my message. Here's the content of it. So it's going to uh, figure out where to publish that uh, in Rabbit, you know, what queue to use, the channel, all that stuff. It's going to handle it all itself, all the routing. It's all going to be handled by itself. And that's, so that's all it. That's all I'm doing with EasyNetQ. It's this line and this line right here. And then we're going to route the console, publish the message, and sleep for one second. So that way I'm only publishing one message per second. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run this console app. So you can see it's doing what we expected, it's publishing a message every one second. Now if I go over to my RabbitMQ management tool, I can see that I'm connected. My guest program's connected. There's a channel there. If I look in queues, there are no queues here. So what's going on? I'm publishing messages every second, and I'm still publishing them, but nothing's showing up in the queue. Well, this is how EasyNetQ is configured to work with the publish and subscribe method. So if I don't have a subscriber, that message that I'm publishing, it gets put out there, but it just goes away because no one is there to subscribe it, right? It's the tree falls in a forest situation. So what I have to do now is, in the same process, I'm going to set up a subscribe. Now, in reality, this subscribe should be in a separate process. Otherwise, it's, we're kind of defeating the purpose of using the queue in the first place. Right? We're publishing a message, pushing the work off to some other process. But just for demonstration, I'm going to keep it here in the same, um, the same program. So now I'm going to subscribe. So in my subscribe method, I again connect to Rabbit by just using rabbithutch.createBus with the connection string. And now I'm going to say I want to subscribe. I'm going to listen for messages of this type. And notice it's a strongly typed. I'm passing in this, the same type of my message as I'm publishing. Then I specify a subscription ID. And I can just make this some arbitrary string. This comes into play when I'm using multiple subscribers. That way I'll know which ones are subscribed, which ones are connected, that each have a different ID. 
And then all I'm doing is just in the subscribe, I'm writing out a message. I received the message for this name and this shoe size. All right. Now I have to run subscribe first because publish goes into an infinite loop and doesn't give us an opportunity to subscribe. Um, so we'll just run that. Okay, so it's publishing a message and now we're receiving the message, which is just a random string and a random number for shoe size. If we go back over here to RabbitMQ Management UI, we see that now there is a queue. And it has a name that EasyNetQ has created based on conventions. We can see that it's the namespace and it also has the um, subscription ID that we put in there, which was just sub ID. And we're not seeing any messages in there right now, 000, because they're all getting processed as soon as they're being published. We can see the message right here. It's publishing, it's processing about one per second, which is about right, with about the rate we're publishing, one per second. So there we go. There's the publish and subscribe method. So just note that you need a subscriber. Otherwise, these messages being published just go off into oblivion. All right, the next method we're going to cover is send and receive. With send and receive, we can send multiple types of messages into a single queue and then receive those messages out of that same queue. Messages will sit in the queue until something comes along to receive them. So unlike publish and subscribe, when we send a message, it goes out there to a queue and sits there. So back over here in the code, we're going to look at the send method first. So we go over to send. See that I'm doing something very similar here. Connecting to Rabbit with, with the EasyNet queue API here, rabbithutch.createBus, same connection string. In my while loop, I'm going to create two different messages, one of my message and one of my other message. This one has a name and shoe size. This one has address and uh, taxes or, or tax rate. Okay. Then to actually send those messages, I say bus.send and I have to give it a queue name because now since we're sending these all to the same queue, we have to specify which queue those are all going to live on. So I'm just calling it my.queue. I'm going to send my message there. I'm going to send my other message there. I'm going to print to console that I sent two different messages and we'll do a thread.sleep for one second. So we're sending two messages every one second. I haven't set up the receive yet. We're just going to go ahead and run this console app. Sent two messages, sent two messages, etc. If I come on over here to the management UI, we see our connection, the channel. If I go to queues, we see that there's my queue, my.queue. It's there. It has 10, this went to 22, and it's going to keep growing. If I go into this queue, and pull one message out, we'll see what the message looks like. So the payload here is just the JSON serialization we saw in a few episodes back. But now notice the properties of this message. There is a type in the header there that corresponds to the type, the C sharp type that we used, my message. If I go ahead and get two messages, it should show us we have one message up here of type my message and another of type my other message. And they're both on the same queue. So this is a great way to just use a single queue to send a, a queue of commands or messages or what have you on, on one single queue. Go back over here and let's uh, I'll stop the console app here. And now we're going to set up a receive. So again, I'm doing it in the same process. You shouldn't do this. You should put it in a separate process. Again, we're just connecting to rabbithutch.createBus. And now to receive messages, we say bus.receive. And the first argument is a string with the queue name, my.q, the same queue name as I used to send the messages. And then the next argument is a lambda. This is a receive registration object. And with that object, we can say, all right, I want to receive messages of type my message. And with those messages, I'm going to do this. In my case, I'm going to write out console.write line. Just write out my message with the name and shoe size. And we can also say, I want to subscribe, sorry, not subscribe. I want to receive messages of another type, my other message. 
and I'm going to do something different with that and so on. I can keep doing more and more messages just subscribing by type all in the same queue though. Okay, so if I run this, let me, yep, if I run this, it uh, processed a whole bunch really quickly there because there was a bit of a backlog on the queue, but now it's down to about two every one second. We're receiving two different message types on the same queue. So this method is really useful if you want those messages to stay in the queue until they're actually received somewhere, as opposed to publish and subscribe, which will only, messages will only be actually communicated if there is a subscriber that exists. Finally, we're going to look at request and response. With request and response, we'll send a request message and then wait for a response message to come back. If there is no response, we'll get a timeout error. Let's go to the code and show how this works. Let's uncomment the request method. So down here in the request, sort of the same pattern we've been seeing the whole episode here, creating a new message and, and uh, requ making a request every one second. The difference is this line here. We're saying bus.request. And the first type argument, my message, is what we're actually, is the request that we're sending. And then the second type argument is the response we expect to receive. And I'm passing the message here as the parameter. And what I get back as response is of type my response. And the only uh, property I have in the response is just this one message string property. So there's also an asynchronous version of this, which is probably um, the correct thing to do instead of a blocking request response. Uh, a little more complex, so I'm going to leave that up to you to go look in the documentation for that. Uh, so right now I just have a request, but no response. I've commented out the response. So let's, let's see what happens when I run this in the console. Okay, it's sending a request, and in a little bit it's going to time out. It's going to be an exception because a response was not received within the expected amount of time. Okay. So there we have, request timed out. So now I'll set up a response. Again, in the same uh, process, you shouldn't do this if you have a separate process. And what I'm doing now is I'm saying bus.respond. And the first type parameter is the request I expect to receive. And the second type parameter is what I'll be returning as part of that response. And then the first parameter is just a lambda where I'm saying return anew my response and then all I'm doing is just populating that message with the contents of the request. So I'm just sort of spitting back what was sent to me. Name and shoe size. Alright, so I'm going to run this. And so now it's going to send a request, get a response, send a request, get a response. And so as long as both the uh, the requester and the responder are both running, this will work just fine. If the responder is down or is is broken, then the request process is going to receive an exception. So I would say think carefully about using this pattern, uh, especially in a user-facing uh, web app, for instance. You can set up to work asynchronously, but it, it still kind of puts one process at the mercy of another process. So there's times where this is a useful pattern, but just, you know, Consider it carefully if this is what you really want, request and response. Now let's look at the management UI here. You can see we've got connections and channels there. If we look at my queues, well, EasyNet Queue has created, looks like, two queues here. The one with the uh, requests and then one to handle the responses. And I didn't have to create, set up any of this stuff. EasyNet Queue is doing all this work for me. It's handling all the details of that. And this pattern in particular is one that's take a lot of extra work to, to set it up and it'd be kind of tricky. So um, easing a queue is handling all that stuff for us. And also notice that this one has some, um, it's an exclusive queue. So if I go in there and try to delete or, or get messages, for instance, uh, it's not going to let me do that. Uh, and that's part of the request and response communications that easing a queue has set up for us. So there you have it. That is the three methods that I want to cover for EasyNetQ. 
This is the last video I have planned for now in this series. I hope you enjoyed the series. I'm going to be talking about RabbitMQ and EasyNetQ at CodeMash 2016 in Ohio. So if you want to discuss it more in person, look for me there. Or you can contact me on Twitter, I'm M. Groves, or leave a comment in the YouTube uh, comment section there below and I'll see it. Thank you very much for watching.